Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we bless your name for our Bible study. Thank you for bringing us here safely. And thank you for all the other people who are still coming. We're praying, O oh Lord, you bless us in the study of the word tonight in Jesus' name. Open our eyes to see exactly what you have for us. And Lord, when we see, help us to act speedily upon the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to the Bible study tonight. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And today we're considering one verse of scripture, very important, very essential. We've gone through already chapter 1. And we've gone through chapter 2. It's like we've come to the end of chapter 2. But we single out verse 18 because of its importance to the believer and to every child of God, to the family of God, the whole church, and then even to the world so that the world will see what hinders them from having what they ought to have, the time they ought to have it. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. The verse of scripture tells us why Paul the apostle, together with his partners, preaching partners Silas and Timothy, why they had not been able to get to Thessalonica again as they planned to do. The people of Thessalonica, if they didn't understand, many of them could complain, but thank God they didn't. Many of them could get into conflict, but thank God they didn't. And many of them could come into condemnation, the condemnation of the apostle, and the condemnation of the partners of the apostles, saying they've lost interest in us. They're not doing the way they used to do. We say we saw they'll come back again, but they're not here. But thank God that he didn't do any of that. And sometimes when things happen in the church, maybe in the headquarters church or in the local church, in the regional church or in the state church, that we need to understand that the whole thing is not in the hands of the leaders, of the leadership. There are times when Satan hinders. Look at that again. It says, wherefore we that means paul silas timothy we would have come unto you even i paul in particular would have come once and again which means i would have come one more than once but satan hindered not just paul the apostle alone but satan hindered the three of them how did that happen and what was he wanting to go and do once again when he said would have come once and again what was he to do? And when our region overseers visit the local governments, why are they doing that? And when the state overseers visit the state, the local churches and the regions and everywhere, why are they doing that? And when any of our leaders and pastors, missionaries, when they visit all those local churches, what are they to do? And what was Paul thinking of going to do? Number one, he wanted to go and give them a second benefit. Second Corinthians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 15. In day, and in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit. There is a first benefit conversion. There is a first benefit salvation. There is a first benefit turning to the Lord. There is a second benefit that is sanctification. That is holiness. That's the strengthening of the church. That's the leading the church to the strength of the Lord. And Paul the Apostle said, I'm coming. I want to come so that you would have a second benefit. And the reason I wanted to go to Thessalonica is so that they'll have that second benefit. Salvation, they had God. Now they needed sanctification. Now they needed holiness. Now they needed to be firm, to be standardized, and to be steadfast in the faith. Number two, that he may impart unto them some spiritual gifts to the end. They may be established. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. 
The reason why I wanted to go to them once and again, and the reason why Satan hindered him and hindered them is so that they will not have this that Paul the Apostle wanted to give unto them. Romans chapter 1 verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. You know, when people are born again, when they come to know the Lord, but they're still doubting, they don't have assurance, is this real? And is it going to last forever? Or is it just for the moment then to establish them and to make them firm in the faith? And whenever we go to do follow-up, isn't that the reason why we go? To visit the people that are born again already and to visit churches that are planted already so that those churches, they'll have an impartation, impact upon their lives and then they will be established. Number three is to establish them in the faith and to strengthen them so that they'll be able to resist this tempter. The tempter is not happy. Satan is not happy. The devils, demons are not happy that believers have come to know the Lord. They have given their lives to know the Lord Jesus Christ and now their names are written in the book of life in heaven and the devil wants to do whatever he can do so that he will tempt them and he will trip them. And it will make them to fall. That's the reason why Paul the Apostle wanted to go there. I want to remind our region of ourselves again, our state of ourselves again, our missionaries again, our pastors again, our group coordinators again. When we go around, we're not just there to entertain the people. When we go around, we're not just to go there and make, how are you there? We're to go there and establish them. We're to go there and establish the second benefit, sanctification, holiness in their lives, in their hearts, in the church. We're to go there and make sure that whatever temptations they're facing, we show them how to resist the temptation and how to stand firm in the righteousness and the holiness of the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, I'm reading there from verse 1. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Wherefore, when we, would, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you, to comfort you concerning your faith that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves, no, that ye were appointed and we were appointed there unto. The reason why Paul the Apostle with his team, why they wanted to visit Thessalonica again is so that they'll be able to strengthen them, establish them in the faith so that the temptation coming to them will not make them to fall. Number four, it was to perfect that which was lacking in their faith. Faith is the reason why we get saved. Faith, faith in Christ. We get saved by faith, by grace through faith. And then we walk by faith. And every blessing we get, we get by faith. And whatever was lacking in their faith, Paul the Apostle wanted to reach out to them so that it will strengthen their faith and perfect their faith. First Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 10. It says, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face. That's why I wanted to come. To come once and again so that we can see your face and in that verse 10 and that we might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Are you not learning something as a believer? You've done the evangelism. Some people have come to know the Lord. Temptation will come to them. Go back to them. Strengthen them. And make them understand that temptations do come. Trials do come. Troubles do come. But we can stand in the Lord and be firm in the Lord and remain in the salvation it has given us. And also when they face some problems and some challenges and they're wondering whether their faith will carry them through or not. You are there to strengthen their faith and to perfect that which is lacking in their faith. Number five, it was to establish their hearts unblameable in holiness before God. We're looking at verse 13 of that same chapter 3. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. 
If there's anything the new convert is ignorant of, is ignorant of righteousness. If there's anything in new church is ignorant of, they're ignorant of holiness. And so we who have preached the gospel to them and we who have followed them up or who are following them up want to be able to reassure them that the reason we became Christians is that we become new creatures in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, is what? Tell me out loud. It's a new creature. All things are passed away. We need to go and reconfirm with those believers. The old habits are gone. And the old character is gone. And the old dispensation, everything is gone. Something is new now. A new life of righteousness. A new life of holiness that they are to live. And that they will be above reproach, above blame, above sport. It says so that we can establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. You see the people of the world before they became born again, those who are born again now, they were living their lives just to please men. Everything they did is how do people see this? How do people appreciate this? How do people commend me, applaud me for this? And now when they become Christians, Paul the apostle wanted them to know that your mind is on God. Your focus is on God. Your appreciation is coming from God. Your commendation is coming from God. He wanted them to know that now the holiness they were to live in was the holiness before God. Even our Father. Yes, the light was shine before men. Your preoccupation is not for man anyway. It is for God. That's what you wanted to go there and do so that they will be established in holiness. Number six was to reassure them concerning their brethren who had died before the rapture. Some of those people in Tasnaika, they began to wonder, now you're talking about the rapture. You're saying that Christ is coming again. And then they went, those of us who are alive will be caught up together with them. What happens to our brethren who, are, who have died? What's going to be their lot and their portion? That's the reason Paul, the apostle, wanted to go back to them so that he can reassure their hearts, so that he can reaffirm their faith, so that he'll tell them that those who have died, they have not lost anything and we have not lost them. Chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Because they were ignorant of that, they were sorrowful, they were sad, somebody had died, some people had died. What's going to be their lot? What's going to be their portion? I about the rapture that is going to take place. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive shall remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed. Or, pre or prevent them, hinder them that which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall de descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth. He said, let your heart be comforted. In fact, those who are dead in Christ, before we are changed, and before we are caught up, and before we are raptured, they will rise up, and then all of us eventually will be together with the Lord. Look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be be of the Lord. I wanted to come and tell you that and comfort you now that I'm not there. You do that yourself and comfort one another with these words. Number seven, it was to prepare them for the coming day of the Lord because that day will come as a thief in the night and because it will come suddenly and yet come surely. Paul the apostle wanted to come to these people on, once and again so that he can reassure them the Lord is coming and the day of the Lord for the believer will be a day of light. And then for the unbeliever will be a day of darkness. For the believer, a day of joy. For the backslider, a day of sorrow and a day of gloom and a day of darkness. And he wanted to come and remind them that because of that coming day, coming suddenly and coming surely, that they need to prepare themselves. Chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you for yourselves. Know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when 
they shall say, peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Then he said, you know, it's been using, they will come upon them as a thief in the night, and they shall not escape. How about us? How about the believer? Can you give us any assurance? What will happen to us? Look at verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should come, should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. He wants us to be ready. Let's come back to First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. Now, you know the reason why he wanted to go there, why he wanted to see them, why he wanted to visit them again, so that they'll be able to stand on shaking, having conviction, and having a kind of steadiness in the Lord. That's why I wanted to go. But then, why did he not go? Why was he not there? Look at verse 18, the latter part. But... Satan hindered us. That's a big question you're asking yourself, you're asking me, you're asking everybody if you can find opportunity. Why will Satan hinder them? And what does Satan hinder? When you're working for Satan, he doesn't hinder you. When you're laboring for the devil, he doesn't hinder you. When you're laboring for something temporary, it doesn't hinder you. When you're laboring for something worthless, useless, of no account, of no benefit to the kingdom of God, it doesn't hinder you. Do you remember that Paul the Apostle had been a religious man? And all the days and all the years, he had been a religion. In fact, he said, I profited above many my equals in religion. Satan never bothered him. Satan never hindered him. But why is Satan hindering at this time? He hinders righteousness. He doesn't hinder religion. He hinders righteousness. He doesn't hinder the people that are superficial in their religion. And people that are just, you know, here and they're very active and going up and down. Satan doesn't mind that. What he wants to hinder is the, is the salvation of souls. The people who are getting saved, the people who are getting to know the Lord. When Satan sees that something is going on and it is not just something that is just religious, but it's producing salvation of souls and it's producing sanctification, holiness, purity of heart, and it's getting people ready for heaven. That's what Satan hinders. And when Satan sees that holiness is being emphasized and holiness is getting to the hearts of the people and getting to the lives of the people and they're having the Christian character, the Christian correct conduct and they're having Christ likeness in their lives and their lives have been changed and turned around. Carnality going, immorality going, evil going and they're turning away from idols and they're turning away when they're turning onto the living God. Then that is what Satan hinders. That is the same why you'll find that the real apostles of the Lord and the real teachers of the gospel and the real preachers of the gospel and those who are real evangelists and they're turning people to Christ people are getting saved and people are getting sanctified, holiness of heart and purity is being passed on to them that's what Satan wants to hinder and you look at your life, maybe you're making fun of your people like Paul Paul, what's the matter with you? Satan hindering you. Everything I do, Satan doesn't even get involved. I just go everywhere I want and there's no hindrance. Check up what you're doing. Is that just religion? Is that just social service? Is that just sacrifice? Religious sacrifice? Is that just depending or maybe developing a denomination? Satan doesn't bother about that. What he bothers about is righteousness. What he worries about is salvation of souls. What he worries about is sanctification of the saints. What he worries about is the expansion and the establishment of the kingdom of God. What he worries about, he doesn't worry about hospitality, you know, going around and uh, throwing a party there, a religious party there, another party over there. And people are in that church, it's wonderful. They just feed us and they give clothes to the naked and give food to the, to the hungry. Satan doesn't bother about that, but he bothers about Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. That's why it says, Wherefore, we would have come 
unto you. Even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. But thank God we are going to overcome. Yeah. I said we are going to overcome. Yeah. That's why we are talking about turning Satan's hindrances to greater soul harvesting. Turning Satan's hindrances to greater soul harvesting. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one. Overcoming hindrances through suitable substitutes. Suitable substitutes. Number two, obtaining help through the saints' supplication. The saints' supplication. Number three, optimum harvest. Great harvest. Best harvest. Desirable harvest through sustainable strategies. Number one, overcoming hindrances through suitable substitutes. Let's come back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Is that the end of the story? Does that mean because Satan hindered and he closed one door, it means that we're not going to look up, open our eyes wide and see all the other possibilities, all the other open doors. Here we find that Paul the Apostle, he made use of suitable substitutes. When we talk of suitable substitutes, that means there are other people that can do the same thing. And we find this all over the scripture, all over the scripture, that when a leader is not able to do something, maybe he's hindered because of sacrifice circumstances, because of situations, because of opposition, because of persecution, because they're looking for just that one and they want to hinder just that leader because he's a champion in the army of the Lord. And then that leader, that champion, that apostle, that prophet, that, that evangelist, he'll then create the situation whereby the other people who are not being targeted, how they can get the work done. Let's come back to First Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, that is, we who would have come, but Satan hindered us, and we couldn't come. When we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, a minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. He said, we had a substitute and it was a suitable substitute. Always remember that, that if you want to get something done, it's the preaching of the gospel, the salvation of souls, visiting them again, doing the follow up, and then you are not able to do that, look for a suitable substitute. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. A suitable substitute for this cause have I sent unto you, Timotheus. Corinthians, I know the need is there. I know you want to see me. I know that I should be there, but now there's no opportunity now. I'm sending a suitable substitute unto you. And what a wonderful thing that we as a church we should learn that if a Paul is not able to get to us, if the state of us is not able to get to us, if the region of us is not able to get to us, if a group coordinator is not able to get to us, there may be suitable substitute. They will send and it will still do the same thing. They say, in the name of Christ, they still and, and they still exalt Christ, and they're still going to call people to know the Lord. And if they pray in the name of Jesus, Jesus is still going to answer that prayer. And therefore, we understand it's not every time Paul the apostle will be there, it's not every time Peter will be there, it's not every time the region of a cell will be there. Sometimes it's a so suitable substitute. And when they come, you receive them, you accept them, and you receive the message, and the Lord will bless all of us in Jesus. Jesus' name. But 17, for this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, and who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. It says, Timothy is coming. It's a suitable substitute, and it's going to bring to you all my ways in the Lord. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 16. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16. But thanks be to God, which puts the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. It says, uh, Paul the Apostle was telling the Corinthians, you know, it's not only myself and it's not only Timothy. There's another man. It's my son in the fifth tomb. And he is also a suitable substitute. And thank God, before I even spoke to him, the Lord put this in his heart. Look at verse 18. And we have sent him. The brother, we have sent with him. The brother, there's another one that is not even named here. I've sent Titus and I've sent another brother along with him whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. He said, the people I'm sending to you, they're suitable and they're capable and they're competent and they will preach the same word unto you. Just let us remember that whenever Paul is not there, there's a Titus around. There's a Timothy around, and they are going to preach the same thing. And what's important is the word. What's important is the Savior. What's important is Christ. What's important is the Holy Spirit. And what's important is the doctrine they are going to emphasize. And they're going to say the same thing as I'm going to say. Look at verse 23. Whether any do inquire of titles, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. Corinthians, you understand that, yes, I know I want to be there. I've told you before that I'm your father, and I've told you before that you may have 1,000, 10,000 teachers, but you only have one father. But yet, those 10,000 teachers, are you not going to listen to them? There's Titus, a partner, and a fellow helper concerning you, and all our brethren be inquired of. They are the messengers of the churches and of the glory of Christ. We're looking at Philip Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 21. It says, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that ye may be that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. You see what Paul the Apostle is saying? He's saying the field is very wide and it's wide for harvest. And I cannot be everywhere at the same time. And because of the limitation of time, and because of the limitation of opportunity, I can send Timothy, I can send Titus, I can even send Tychicus. And he's a faithful minister too, and a beloved brother. He will make known all things unto you. Verse 22, whom I have sent unto you. For the same purpose, that she might know our fears, and that he might uh, that he might comfort your heart. We learn then that when things are so tough, or maybe things are so tight that Paul the Apostle cannot be there, we're going to receive and we're going to benefit from the ministry of these suitable substitutes. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4 verse 7. Colossians chapter 4 verse 7. Here Paul the Apostle is telling us now about another privilege that, that we have. We're looking at chapter 4 verse 7. All my stay shall take a cause, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. Well, we're we'll learning a lot of lessons from this. Number one, that wherever Timothy was pastoring, we must not uh, say, well, Timothy is here, therefore, Paul, leave him alone. Don't touch him. Don't send him anywhere. We love him. We accept him. We benefit from his ministry. And you disorganize things, the administration in the church. Uh, Paul, when you send Timothy, anywhere you want to go, go there yourself. Well, Paul, the apostle said, I cannot go everywhere myself. In fact, there are places I want to go, but Satan hindered us. And because of that hindrance, I'm taking Timothy out of that place, and I'm going to tell Timothy, go to this other place. And surprisingly, Timothy came back from that place, and Paul, the apostle, said, Tim uh, Timothy, there's another place I'm sending you to. And would you know that Timothy was a pastor, a resident pastor in another place at this time, when Paul the Apostle was sending him to Thessalonica, sending him to Corinth, and sending him to all these other places? It's not the people that are idle will pick up and send somewhere. It's not the people that have nothing doing will pick up and send somewhere. It's the people who are busy already. 
like Timothy. It's people that are busy already, like Titus. Look at First Timothy chapter one verse three. First Timothy chapter one verse three. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy was not jobless, was not idle, was not that free. And yet Paul, the apostle, said, hey, come on, Timothy. I ought to go to Eternica, but I cannot go now. I leave that Ephesus and go there. Another time, uh, Timothy, that's enough. Now you've done enough in, in Eternica. I want you to go to Corinth. And you were already about Titus. Do you remember Titus? Titus chapter 1. I'm reading Titus chapter 1 in verse 5. For this cause, let I thee, Titus, in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I appointed, as I had appointed thee. Titus too was not jobless. Titus was not idle. Titus had something doing. But Paul the apostle said, Titus, I need you in Corinth too. And then he sent him to Corinth. And we're read about Tychicus. And Tychicus will mention, you have the mention of Tychicus in, in Ephesus. And now as we come to, as we come to another place again, Colossians chapter 4, we find Tychicus again. And Paul the apostle saying, I want to send you here. Now Paul the apostle, can we ask you a question? Are there not other people? Why don't you leave this Timothy in Ephesus where he is and leave Titus in Crete where he is and leave Tychicus in the place where he is, where you are put him? Why are you sending these people? Can't you find other people? It says these are the suitable substitutes. And the beauty of it in the New Testament is that we never found any complaint. Never, never any complaint from all those churches where Timothy was taken and sent out to another place. There was no complaint in the place where Titus was and sent to another place. And there was no complaint in where Tychicus was and sent to another place. I pray that all these things that we learn will become practical knowledge for us in Jesus' name. Number one, that for example, when I'm supposed to be somewhere and I'm not able to go there, that people are not going to complain and they're not going to say, why is it? And you know, the pastor is not coming to us. And when we say somewhere, then you close your eyes and close your Bible and then turn the other way and say, I'm not going to listen. When the pastor, when the GS comes himself, that's when I'm going to listen. Hey, that's a wrong attitude. The other thing we need to take care of is that, let's say there's a Timothy and he's doing a great job in Ephesus. There's a Tyche because he's He's doing a great job in another place and then there's a Titus. He's doing a great job in, uh, in Crete. And then the GS says, uh, now Titus, I need to, for you to go over here that nobody is complaining. Nobody is grumbling. Why is it all this? Say, well, you understand? I travel around myself. I go to places myself and when the work becomes so expansive and so great that I cannot go everywhere, we have the Timothys there. We have the Tituses there. We have the Tychicus there. And we're going to send them and when they are sent, anywhere they are sent to, thank God they are going to be obedient in Jesus' name. And as they are obedient to the word of the Lord, I pray that our people that they are going to will benefit and get the word from them in Jesus' name. We are looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 2 and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. In St. Timothy, as I have trained you and trained Titus and trained Tychicus and train the, all the other people, Aquila, Priscilla, everybody. You too, train other people so that when the work expands and when the work is established and when you need to send other people to you to go and represent you and when you are looking for suitable substitutes, you'll be able to find people to pick on. We're saying the same thing to our state of Assyria's train people. We're saying the same thing to the region of Assyria's train people. I'm sure you are not waiting until we announce national workers training until we announce national or international workers retreat before you have workers training in your region workers training in your state workers no, workers training in your in your in your nation that okay we're still waiting why are you waiting timothy also was to train the workers as paul had trained the people all the two people are not waiting in the various groups we're waiting until the gs will announce this and announce this why does he have to do that there you are do something. All those weekends are there. Get the time out and train the workers so that when we need suitable substitutes, we'll be able to pick them up and send them there and this work will keep on expanding and expanding in Jesus' name. Chapter 2, verse 2 again. Second Timothy. 
and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same the same don't change the doctrine train or the same doctrine emphasize the same doctrine emphasize the same christian life the same holiness the same sanctification don't omit anything the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also now before i leave that point i want to remind you that timothy or titus or tychicus or aquila or priscilla or any of these other people they were fast a suitable substitute what i mean by fast f they were faithful a they were available s they were steadfast t they were teachable these people that were sent out that could go and reach out to other people teach other people one yes they were fast fast in the sense that they obeyed promptly they obeyed immediately they were fast in the sense that the moment they were told to go that week they were already there they were fast but then as you spell that out faithful and that's what paul the apostle said about timothy that's what he said about titus they were faithful men faithful women and then that's what was saying about the people today suitable substitutes the jesus to go somewhere he's not able to go he's sending you be fast be faithful and then be available timothy was available titus available tychicus was available all these people that paul the apostle sent out they were available they didn't say i'm sorry paul i'm tired now you know i just came back for Tesnica, and now i'm going to go to corinth and then I'm going to go to all this place. You know, Pastor, let, let's consider this thing. When somebody is shifting and moving about, today is Ephesus, tomorrow is Corinth, and the other day it's Anika. You know, a kind of a person is shifting. Uh, there's no time to settle down. Can I settle down for some time? They were available. Then they were steadfast. And they just kept on doing what they ought to do, unmovable in the work of the Lord, knowing that their work was going to be rewarded. That's what we read about in First Corinthians chapter 15. 15 verse 58 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast and movable always abounding in the work of the lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the lord steadfast they were and then teachable they were teachable everything paul the apostle taught them they went to teach the other people to num point number two now obtaining help through the same supplication obtaining help through the same supplication i'm coming back to first thessalonians chapter 2 First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Uh, there's something we find out about Paul the Apostle. He knew his duty. He knew his responsibility. And he knew that physically he should go to all those places. But then there were hindrances. Do you know one thing that Paul the Apostle did? He prayed supplication supplication the same supplication look at first thessalonians chapter one i'm reading from verse two we give thanks to god always for for you all making mention of you in our prayers making mention of you in our prayers he knew that if he couldn't go to preach he could pray always praying for them i'm looking at romans we're looking at romans chapter one verse eight Romans chapter 1 verse 8. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And it says that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Always in my prayers prayers he wanted to reach out to them and he couldn't reach out to them you know the same hindrance he had even to go to rome but he said even though i couldn't come there to preach in the physical i'm praying for you romans chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 22 romans chapter 15 verse 22 for which cause also i have been much hindered from coming to you he wanted to go to rome as well he wanted to go everywhere go to philippi go to Colosse, and go to laodicea and go to rome and go to ephesus and go everywhere and he couldn't go everywhere he wanted to go and he said yes i know what i'll do i'll be praying for them praying for them and so we understand that even though you cannot do everything like that in the physical you are also you are praying we're looking at ephesians chapter 3 ephesians chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 14 
saying, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by spirit in the inner man. He said, If I come to you, that's what I will do. I'll be strengthening you in the inner man, strengthening your spiritual life. Because I cannot come, there's, this, there's something else I can do. I can make supplication. I can pray. And that's what he did. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. For they and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in, the, in knowledge and in all judgment. You know what Paul the apostle did? He said, I shall come there, but I'm not able to come. I shall visit you. I'm not able to visit you, but it's something I'm doing every day. I carry on ministry towards you every day. The ministry of prayer and supplication. What a lesson we're learning. That we don't need to be somewhere physically before we minister to them. We can be praying every day and praying every time and saying, oh Lord, raise up people that will get this work done and touch those Thessalonian believers and those Colossians and those Philippians who will touch them and turn them around and make them to be the kind of people they ought to be. Colossians chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. It says, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I'm asking a question. If Paul the apostle went to Colossae, what will he do? He'll teach them. What will the teaching do? The teaching will give them the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And he couldn't go in the physical. What did he do then? He began to pray. And so we understand that all those hindrances of the devil, we can pray. And when we pray, God will answer the prayer. And once we're praying, number one, we can send suitable substitutes. Number two, we can have the same supplication. And all that will be getting the work done. Our prayer can remove the hindrances of Satan. And it will. When the believer prays in the Savior's name, it is the same as if the Lord Jesus himself was making the supplication and making the request to the Father. Prayer changes things and prayer changes people and prayer changes circumstances and prayer makes a seemingly helpless minority a mighty force that can influence the destiny of nations. And so we understand what kind of prayer, what kind of prayer we ought to pray. I want to tell you once another thing is that Satan does not stop his hindrances. He tries to hinder prayer to you. He doesn't uh, hinder prayer, the prayer for bread and butter. He can allow you to go of that to fill your belly if your soul is empty and to fill your stomach if your spirit is empty. He doesn't mind about caring for material things and praying for material things. The kind of prayer he tries to hinder the prayer of Abraham for Sodom and Gomorrah. That one, he'll try to hinder. The prayer of Moses for the children of Israel. When the children of Israel back and went gone away from the Lord. And now Moses began to pray, O oh Lord, count these people as your people. Restore them. Bring them back to your grace again and count them as yours. If we have found grace in your sight, that's the kind of prayer Satan wants to hinder. He wants to hinder the prayer of Daniel that will take the time apart and wait upon the Lord praying for the people of Israel to be restored from their captivity and the prayer that will restore backsliders from backsliding and will restore saints unto holiness, sanctification, righteousness and purity. That's the kind of prayer Satan would like to hinder the kind of prayer that Jesus Christ prayed and Jesus said we should pray. That's the kind of prayer Satan tries to hinder. Now we're thinking about our nation. We're coming back to our continent, Africa. Many places they're praying but it's kind of prayer they're not praying. The kind of prayer that Abraham prayed for Soma and Gomorrah, they're not praying that kind of prayer. All they're praying for, give us healing, give us money, give us car, give us aeroplane, give us land, help us to build this and that, give us wives and give us children. That's all the prayer they're praying. Most of the people, millions of people, as they gather together. But the prayer 
that will save Sodom and Gomorrah. The prayer that will turn all the tide of immorality and defilement, turn all that around. They're not praying that kind of prayer. The prayer that Jesus said we should pray, that the Lord will send laborers into the vineyard, into the harvest field. That kind of prayer, they're not praying. But it's only the prayer for materials, the prayer for righteousness, for holiness, for sanctification, and for the strengthening of the churches. That kind of prayer, they're not praying. And the Lord is telling us, yeah, the Satan has succeeded in hindering many people from praying the right kind of prayer. And uh, the right kind of prayer, they're not praying all these other things they're praying for. I pray God will touch us. And as Satan has hindered other people from praying the, kind of, the right kind of prayer, we will not be hindered in Jesus' name. What kind of prayer are we praying? I want you to look at uh, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, and the, but the and laborers are few. Pray ye therefore. That's what the Lord said. Pray ye therefore. That's what he commanded. Pray ye therefore. That's what he's expecting. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And that's uh, what Satan has successfully hindered in many places. The prayer that we pray that you will send laborers into the harvest. We're looking at that same thing in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Luke chapter 10, we're looking at verses 1 and 2. When you are not praying this kind of prayer, it means Satan is hindering you. When all the prayer you are praying is only for material things, superficial things, and only for physical things, the things that will perish here in the world. When that's the only kind of prayer you're praying only for yourself. You're not praying for salvation of souls. You're not praying for servants and leadership and, and leaders to be raised up. You're not praying for evangelists and pastors to be raised up. You're not praying for churches to be planted. All the prayer you're praying, give me this, give me this, give me this. That means Satan has successfully hindered you from praying the kind of prayer. I pray that that hindrance will be broken today in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. It says, after these things, the Lord appointed all the seventy also, and he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself will come. Therefore said he also unto them, The harvest really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, pray ye therefore. As we are preaching, then we pray. As we are going out to the harvest field and bringing people to know the Lord, we're still praying that we know we cannot finish the work. We're saying, O oh Lord, raise up other people. Raise up laborers. Raise up evangelists. Raise up soul winners that will preach real, real salvation of souls and will preach real holiness of life and will preach real righteousness, purity in the lives of people that are coming to know the Lord. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. I'm looking at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, the kind of prayer the Lord is wanting us to pray so that all these hindrance, hindrances of the devil, the Lord will kind of destroy them and crush them. Romans chapter 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. That's the kind of prayer we're praying. Because that is the one that will be able to turn all the strategies of the enemy, the strategy of the, of the devil, turn it upside down when the people are actually saved. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we need to pray Pray for the ministers and pray for all the ministers to be raised up. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins. And for me. And for me, Paul the Apostle said, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. 
It's saying that it's not only the physical hindrance, there's the psychological hindrance, there's the emotional hindrance, there's the spiritual hindrance. You know, there are times you go to a place, it's not that you're not even able to go in the physical. You're able to go there physically. Like Paul, the apostle was not able to go to Tesnaika physically. And he's saying, pray for me so that God will open doors. Pray for me so that I'll be released and I'll be able to go. What if you go? And then the hindrances are still there. Oh, you saw can hindrances be there when you are there already? Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer. A, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was by Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius uh, Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. In this case, it wasn't a physical hindrance. It wasn't that the opportunity to preach was taken away. It wasn't that you know the door was closed. The door was open. The man was there. He wanted to hear the gospel. And Paul, the apostle, was available to preach the gospel in verse 8 but Elimas and the sorcerer for so is his name by interpretation which stood them hindered them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith that's why I told you sometimes it's not even a physical hindrance it's a spiritual hindrance emotional hindrance psychological hindrance or disturbance that will not want the word of God to come out and reach out to the people that's why I say pray for me pray for me so that I'll be able to preach and open from my mouth boldly as I ought to speak. And Paul the apostle became bold here. Verse 9 Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. That's boldness, that courage, that's tenacity, that's resilience. And it says, And said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. That's the prayer we pray, that these apostles and these evangelists and these pastors and teachers, as God is sending them for sending us forth, God will give us boldness. God will give us authority. And what we ought to say, we'll say and will not back down or turn back or cringe or give in or give up because of any challenge. And when the church prays, that's what we're going to have. We'll have it in Jesus' name. It says 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians, we're looking at chapter 3 and we're looking at verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Have you noticed that whenever there's going to be a crusade, whenever there's going to be a kind of open air meeting, open air campaign, the people are busy praying, oh God, give us miracle. Oh God, give us healing. Oh God, give us deliverance. Oh God, bring the sinners. Oh God, the, the only thing they don't pray about is that the wicked men that may want to hinder the salvation of the souls, the wicked men and the, uh, the unbelieving men, the sinful men that may want to hinder the free flow of the word of God, that uh, God will arrest those men and stop them in their track. The only thing they don't pray about is for the people who are going to minister, for the evangelist, the pastor, the preacher is going to minister, and for the people who are going to bring the power of God to bear in the lives of the people. And so the Lord is telling us here that whenever we're going to have meetings like this we know that hindrances might come psychological, spiritual, physical circumstantial or society or whatever or religious kind of hindrance but if we pray all those hindrances will be crushed in Jesus name that we may be delivered from unreasonable men and wicked men for all men have not faith but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil he will keep you from evil we're looking at Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Romans chapter 15, 
and we're looking at verse 30 here that we'll pray pray for your preachers pray for the pastors pray for the overseers state overseers regional overseers national overseers pray for them that the word of the lord through them will have free cause and the power of the Lord through them will have real authority. And the name of Jesus will be mighty in their mouth. And the word of salvation will be very clear. And people who are sinners, they'll be broken down, convicted. And they'll come to know the Lord and have real, genuine salvation. Real change of life. Real transformation of life. In Romans chapter 15 verse 30, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit that he strive to gain with me in your prayers to God for me. He says you are doing this because of the love you have for God. For because of the concern you have for souls and because of the devotion you have to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says strive with me in your prayers for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Strive with me your prayers for the love of the spirit that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and at my service which I have, which I have for Jerusalem Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. God and me with you be refreshed. You saying, yes, we can come. What if we come restricted and restrained? What if we come depressed and discouraged? What if we come sorrowful and sad? What if we come just you know what just just to obey, just to obey God and just to fulfill all righteousness? But then there is no joy in our service. You say, pray that all these things that hinder the joy of ministry and the free flow of the power of God that makes us to see the is souls and brings joy into our souls. Pray that all those hindrances or the joy of ministry the Lord will take it away. And as the Lord answers your prayer, he'll bless the multitude, he'll bless the preacher, he'll bless you the prayer warriors too in Jesus name. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4 verses 2 to 4. Colossians chapter 4 and I'm reading there from verse 2. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2 it says continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving, without praying also for us. With all the prayers you are praying, with all the commitments you have in supplication, praying for us that God will open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Prayer is very important. Somebody has written, captured the power of prayer like this. He said, prayer has divided seas, rolled up rolling, uh, flowing rivers, and made flinty rocks gush into fountains, quenched flames of fire. Prayer has muscle lions, disarmed vipers and poisons, marshaled the stars against the wicked, and stopped the course of the moon. Prayer has arrested the rapid sun in its great rays, and prayer has burst Open iron gates, recall soul from eternity, and conquer the strongest of devils. And prayer has commanded legions of angels down from heaven. We're talking about prayer, the prayer that the saints ought to pray, the prayer that believers ought to pray, the prayer that the church ought to pray for our ministers, for our overseers, and for the leaders, and for the evangelists and pastors and teachers. Prayer has bridled and changed the raging passions of men and routed and destroyed the vast armies of proud, daring, blustering atheists. Prayer has brought one man from the bottom of the sea and carried another man in a chariot of fire to heaven. What has not prayer done? Satan cannot hurt the work of God when we pray will not halt, will not hurt, and will not hinder the work of God when we pray. We are going to pray. We're looking at Zechariah, Zechariah chapter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Zechariah chapter 3. There are times when a man of God, a preacher of the gospel, an evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, an overseer is uh, wanting to do the word of God, wanting to do the work, and wanting to stand firmly. And Satan is standing behind that individual saying, no, this will not be done. That's a hindrance. But when we pray, Satan will be restrained and rebuilt. Zechariah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. We have a lot of plans we want to preach, a lot of plans we want to evangelize. 
a lot of plans to want to make sure that everybody in our niche, everybody in our country hears the gospel, want to go here and go there. We have the vision, we have the dream, we have the goal, we have the energy, we have the commitment, we have the consecration. But it says, and Satan stood at his right hand to resist him. You know, the church needs to understand, the people of God needs to understand that it's not that people of God don't have, that the preachers don't have vision, our overseers don't have vision. It's not that our coordinators, group coordinators don't have vision. Yes, we all have the vision. But what if there's a Satan standing to resist all the goal, all the dream, all the energy, all the aspiration, all the ambition, all the things we want to do? And the Lord said unto Satan, and so the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And in our prayer, we can make the Lord to rebuke Satan. And then to release the servants of the Lord. Number one, the prayer will release, they will rebuke or restrain Satan. Number two, the prayer will release the servants of the Lord. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12, we're looking at verse 5. And Peter therefore was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Peter was an apostle, a great, great apostle, a forefront apostle. He shouldn't be in the prison at that time. He should be on the field. He should be preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. But then restriction came. And you know, some people might say, if you don't understand this, that this is the work of the devil, that, well, they are slowing down. They are not doing as they wanted to do anymore. Do you realize there can be a hindrance? And do you realize there can be a kind of spiritual impact? imprisonment, psychological imprisonment or physical imprisonment or society imprisonment but the church realized and the church prayed without ceasing and he says unto God and then what happened we're told in verse in verse 7 and behold the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise arise up quickly and his chains fell off from his hands that's what prayer can do I said that's what prayer can do and our prayers will do that in Jesus' name. And the angel of the, and the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And, and so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought it was, he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they, they came unto the iron gate that lead us into the city which opened to them of his own accord how did that happen which key opened that door the key of prayer your prayer will do that closed doors will open can i can i remind you that those people that were praying they didn't see the angel those people that were praying they didn't see the locked doors open those people that were praying they didn't see all these things happening they still continue praying and continue praying continue praying god will answer your prayer and when god rewards the preachers it will reward the people that have been praying it will reward the people that make the doors open it will reward the people that makes opportunities come. It will reward the people that make salvation of souls to come unto the people that are lost in sin. And then it says, they went out and passed on through one street and forth, forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the experience expectation of the people of the Jews. The Lord will do that once again. But you know that he does more than that. I want you to look at verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them and of Tyre and Sidon. But they came from one with one accord to him. And having made blasters, the king's chamberlain, their, their friend, they desired peace. And because their country was nourished by the king's, by the king's uh, country. And upon the said day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel. 
sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not the voice of a man. Verse 23, And immediately who appeared? Who delivered Peter? I said, Who delivered Peter? Angel of the Lord. Who came now to Herod? Angel of the Lord, the angel of those smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. Everybody read verse 24, the next verse there. God removed the stumbling block because the church prayed. He released the servant of God. He restrained Satan. He removed the stumbling block. The fellow that said, while I'm here, no more preaching. While I'm here, I'm going to imprison those champion preachers. God removed that one because the church prayed. And now the word of the Lord increased and multiplied. Not only that, he reveals strategies. Reveal strategies. What we need to do. I want you to look at Second Samuel chapter 15. Second Samuel chapter 15. And I'm reading there to you from verse 31. Second Samuel chapter 15, verse 31. Uh, the, the problem here was that um, Absalom came against David, his father, and he wanted him actually killed, destroyed. He wanted him dead so that he could take over. But God had not appointed him. And if that had happened, the whole nation would have gone into darkness. And the Lord wanted to preserve the light, the light of the truth of the word of God in the nation. But David to still remain there. In fact, David was referred to as the light of the nation. That's why they said, you're not going to battle with us anymore so that you do not quench and do not put off the light of the nation. And that's what Absalom wanted to put off. And David just prayed a single prayer. Look at this in 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31. One told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. I'm reading this to you because there are people that say, yeah, I don't have enough time to pray. You don't have enough time to just say, oh Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ethophel into foolishness. How much time does that take? You don't have to stay there for one hour. You don't have to stay there for 24 hours the whole day praying. You don't have to be walking up and down about, you know, seven hours praying. Just this. He said, oh Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. If you pray like that, I take a minute, you take a minute, he takes a minute, they take a minute. All over this nation, we just mentioned that sentence. All the people that hinder the gospel turn their plan and their strategy into foolishness. Open the door. Just a one minute prayer. Just a five minute prayer. You can do that. You cannot say, I don't have time. I don't have time. Look at the prayer. Turn the foolish, turn the wisdom and the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. We're looking at chapter 16, verse 23. Chapter 16, verse 23. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. This Ahithophel, that man was wise. Whenever he counseled, it was like an angel talking. But now David prayed a one-sentence prayer. What's the result? Chapter 17, verse 1. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue and after David this night. Verse 4, and the saint pleased Absalom well, and all the elders of Israel. The saint pleased everybody in the nation. But look at verse 14. Verse 14, Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Ushai, the, of the Akakite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. They had said before, Ahithophel, you, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head. This is good. But because of the prayer of David, they turned and they said, Ah, Ahithophel, what you have said, we're not going to accept that at this time. The Lord turned it to foolishness. You can pray to you and you will pray. I said we shall pray. 
And it doesn't take a long, long time. See the prayer that David prayed as we're praying for the gospel to circle this whole nation and this whole continent and all the hindrances of the enemy of the devil that God will bring it to an end. He'll bring it to an end in Jesus' name. Verse 14, for the Lord has appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel. It was a good counsel, but the Lord appointed to defeat it for, to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. That means then we need to pray strategic praying. I come to point number three now, optimum harvest through sustainable strategies optimum harvest through sustainable strategies optimum means the best best harvest unequal harvest great harvest most desirable harvest through sustainable strategies there are strategies we need to understand let's come back to first Thessalonians chapter chapter two first thessalonians chapter two and i'm reading from verse 18 once again first Thessalonians chapter two verse 18 wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. What are we going to do now? Because Satan has hindered us, wanted to come, but we couldn't come. Now, what was he to do? I want you to look at this in chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Chapter 5, verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. This epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. What's the strategy here? He couldn't preach, so he wrote. The message you have gone to preach there, he wrote it down and he sent it to them. And he said, I'm sending you this. This is what I've come to do. This is what I would have come to tell you. All that I will preach unto you, all this I have been studying for all these weeks now. This is what I wanted to come and do and say and preach and teach. But because I cannot come in the physical, there's another strategy and it's a strategy of writing. He put it down. You're going to find that that strategy God himself gave it on to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 36. Look at verse 1. And it came to pass in the fourth year of, Je of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the, uh, from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee. Write therein all the words I have spoken unto thee. At that time, Jeremiah was locked up in the prison. And because he was in the prison, he couldn't, he couldn't come out and he couldn't go and tell them directly the word the Lord has spoken to him. Look at verse 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch saying, I am shut up, I am hindered. I'm locked up here and cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore, go thou and read in the roll, which thou hast written from my mouth, the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the, upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of the cities. The strategy the Lord has given is that even though we are not able to go there physically, we can send literature. We can write. Now there's telephone. Now there's internet. Now there's television. Now there's radio. There's a lot that can be done. I will not say because we cannot go there in the physical. Because of that, we cannot do this or that. Would you know that by the grace of God, there are times when I'm not able to go to a particular place. A few weeks ago, we uh, were planning a particular meeting, and I should have been there. But I was, uh, you know, busy in another place, preaching in another place. But he told me when the preachers will be there. And so, that is the pastors who are planning a mighty crusade over there. And while the preachers were gathered together in my place where I was, I took time off from where I was uh, having meeting. I said, I have another appointment now, and then we'll put the computer 
gathered there and he did a, you know, some kind of things and I saw the people there in another country. I could see their picture and then as I, you know, greeted them, good afternoon brothers and sisters and we thank the Lord for this uh, meeting. I want to encourage you that this meeting we're going to do it and I'm there with you and then they said amen and all that and they saw my picture while I was talking and I saw their picture and then after that I gave them the message and I opened the scripture. I said open to this and open to that and we did all that even though I couldn't go there physically there's a lot that can be done today writing is there recording is there television is there internet is there and 24 by 7 is there a lot will be done we're going to do it and the email is there too everything is there and we can use all these things and we're going to reach out to the gospel in Jesus name write it down write it down and send it to them or record it or whatever it is show the picture do everything and give it to them and the work of god will go on without any hindrance in jesus name we're looking at luke chapter one i'm reading from verse one luke chapter one we're reading from verse one for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us even as they delivered them unto us which from the beginning him were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the first, from the from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. If we cannot go there physically, we can write it down. We are looking at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading there from verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, it says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle of Patmos, that is in the isle that is called Patmos. Here he was a kind of banished into the isle of Patmos. He couldn't come out to preach unto them, to preach to the seven churches in Asia Minor. But then it were told that the word of the Lord of God, for the word of the Lord, for the word of God, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit in the last day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book. You cannot live here physically. You are banished there. You are abandoned here. You are imprisoned here. You are captured here. Write it down in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia Minor. The Lord is telling us that we can write it and we can send it to them. And uh, what we have learned, look at the first sentence that, that we're studying. If Paul, the apostle, had gone there in the physical, maybe he'll just preach and that will be all. But he couldn't go there. And now what he's saying to them still benefited them and has benefited many many generations and it's even done much more than the devil tried to hinder the written epistle has even resulted in a greater glory to God and much spiritual blessing to the generations of believers and to us and nursing the printed page for the gospel always defeats Satan's plans and strategies to hinder the salvation of sinners or to hinder the growth of the Christians the written word knows no fear the reaching word never tires. The reaching word works 24 hours of the, of the day. The reaching word can even keep on walking and keep on preaching while the preachers and the printers are, are asleep and they are resting. It is never discouraged and will, not, and will tell its story over and over again. The reaching word is more permanent than the human voice. It continues to speak and make its message plain after audible words have been forgotten and lost. It is immune to sickness or disease or immune to Satan's hindrances. The shortest paragraph may be used of God as the stone in David's sling. In the hands of Jesus Christ, that reaching word, a single paragraph, a single word may bring down a giant soul. The reaching word of the recorded word Word can penetrate so deeply and witness so daringly and abide so persistently and influence so irresistibly where ministers and missionaries may not be able to go. And as the Lord has given us the reaching word, we'll use it advantageously in Jesus' name. The hindrances of Satan will not hold, we will overcome. 
and the open door the Lord has set before us, nothing and nobody will close it in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, I'm reading now from verse 8. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man shall shut it. When there's no chance to pray to preach, we'll pray. And when we pray, God will open more doors in Jesus' name. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan who are trying to shut the doors, which said they are Jews and they are not. But do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet, and they will know that I have loved thee. And because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. And shall come, and which shall come upon all the world to try them that, are, that live upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast that thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh, who is that? He that overcometh will overcome. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? The Lord has given us a great gospel to preach, and nothing will hinder that gospel. And when Satan tries to block this way, another way will open. He has said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're going to do that. And nothing will stop us. And nothing will hinder us. And nothing will shut our mouth. We'll preach, we'll pray, and God will save multitudes. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has called us to do such a great, great, great work. And the Lord has said, it's open a door before us. And whatever it is the devil tries to do in wanting to shut the door and in wanting to hinder the preaching of the gospel, the propagation of the gospel, and the salvation of souls, we're praying that the Lord himself will silence the enemy. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. If you, have not, if you are not born again yourself, pray that God will open your eyes and bring conviction unto you and you will be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Don't let Satan hinder your salvation. We're praying for you. The church is praying for you. Believers are praying for you. Now you open your mouth and say, Lord, I turn away from my sin. I turn away from morality, from my idols, from adultery, fornication, evil. I call upon you. Save me, Lord. And the Lord will save you. And the devil has no power to hinder your salvation. Church is praying. People of God are praying. And Christ is praying for you too. Soul winners. That's, every, that's what everybody ought to be in the church of the living God. The devil tries to hinder soul winning. That will not reach out for souls and preach the gospel unto those who need to be saved. Let's pray that God will bring that revival of soul winning again. The fire upon the believers that we will all be soul winners. That the Lord himself will raise us up, send us out, preach the gospel to every creature. Satan tried to hinder Paul, but he had suitable substitutes. Suitable substitutes. Preachers, evangelists, pastors, teachers of the world, soul winners, laborers, servants. Titus was there, Timothy was there, Tychicus was there, Aquila was there, Priscilla was there, Dorcas was there, Lydia was there. You are there. You pray. Where the pastors are not able to reach you, are you able to reach them? What the overseers are not able to reach you, are able to reach them? What the coordinators are not able to reach you, are able to reach there? Pray that the Lord himself will stir you up. So while the devil is trying to close the door against Paul, against Silas, against Timothy, close the door to Thessalonica, that the Lord himself will make you see the open door before you. That she will be the suitable substitute, the suitable, the suitable evangelist and the suitable soul winner, the suitable preacher of the word of God. Amen. 
that God will open your mouth, open your heart, reach out to them. The people that need to hear the gospel. That's all the coldness and the lethargy. The Lord will take it away. The lukewarmness, the Lord will take it away from you, from everyone. That will not leave Paul alone to do the preaching. Timothy alone to do the preaching. Silas alone to do the preaching. Tychicus alone to do the preaching. Titus alone to do the preaching. Aquila, Priscilla alone to do the preaching. That you will rise up. And you will say, Lord, I'm available. I'll be faithful. I'll be available. I'll be steadfast. I'll be teachable. And the things I hear, the words I hear, I will go and declare unto people around me this gospel shall be preached in all the world. Not only Paul, you are there. Not only Timothy, you are there. Don't allow Satan to hinder you. Don't allow Satan to hinder our preachers. Don't allow Satan to hinder our evangelists. Physical hindrance, psychological hindrance, spiritual hindrance. Pray that the salvation of souls will be very important to you. I said, it was important to Paul. Important to Timothy. And when God picks up Timothy, if that Timothy happens to be your pastor, if that Timothy happens to be your state overseer, if that Timothy happens to be your region overseer, and he's sent to Corinth, or he's sent to Thessalonica, or he's sent to Ephesus, you'll not grumble. You will not complain. You will not fight. You will not slander. You will not grumble. You will not oppose. You will not persecute. You will not try to scatter the church. Because Paul called Timothy out of your region, out of your state, to go to another place. You praise the Lord. You glorify the Lord. That Paul had confidence in our Timothy. God, uh, God had him confidence in Titus and allowed Paul to send him out to where Paul should have gone. And when Paul couldn't go there, he sent Timothy, he sent Titus, sent Titus. And now he's sending our Timothy, sending our overseer, sending our pastor to go there. You praise the Lord for that and keep on praying that God will bless the ministry of Paul and bless the ministry of Timothy and bless the ministry of Titus, everything they're doing, where they're going, the souls will be, will be saved. That multitudes will come to know the Lord in real powerful conversions. Suitable substitutes. Pray that the Lord will so use you, will so use us, all together, that the word of the Lord be reaching out through the same supplication. The same supplication. Paul the Apostle prayed. We oversee us if we're not able to go to a place, we'll pray. We'll make intercession. The kind of intercession Abraham made for Sodom and Gomorrah. Pray. That they will not be destroyed. Praying that they will not perish. Praying that they'll get saved. Praying that they'll be convicted of their sins. Praying that real, genuine conversion will come upon them. Praying that they'll not be lost. The kind of prayer that Moses prayed for Israel when they all went astray to worship idols. That God will help you to pray that kind of prayer. That the level of your prayer will be heightened, increased. Important prayer, essential prayer, prayer for salvation, the salvation of sinners, the restoration of backsliders, salvation of those who have never known the, who have not known the Lord, 
Revival in the church. Revival in the church. Revival of salvation. Revival of consecration. Revival of sanctification. Revival of holiness, righteousness, and purity. That's the prayer we're praying. Essential prayer. Important prayer. So that all that Satan tries to hinder in preaching, a prayer will effect it. A prayer will bring it to pass. A prayer will make it happen. The kind of prayer that Daniel prayed. That forgiveness will come to those who, have, who are guilty. Light will come to those who are in darkness. Revival will come to those who are lukewarm. Cleansing will come to those who are dirty, defiled. Sanctification will come to those who are saved. The power of the Spirit, Holy Ghost baptism, will come to those who are saved and sanctified and made holy and righteous. Pray that what we are not able to do because of the hindrance of Satan in preaching, a prayer, our intercession, a supplication will get it done. Paul prayed. Preachers also must keep on praying. Overseers must keep on praying. National overseers, state overseers, region overseers, pastors, evangelists, leaders in the church, pray that all hindrances of Satan will be broken and destroyed. Praying for laborers to come into the harvest field. The field indeed is white for harvest and plenteous, but the laborers are few. The preachers are few. The evangelists are few. The teachers are few. The apostles are few. That God will send forth laborers into the harvest field. That's the prayer the Lord Jesus Christ commanded us to pray. Obedience to the Lord will make us pray that kind of prayer. More evangelists will be raised up. More preachers will be raised up. More soul winners will be raised up. More workers will be raised up. That will send the gospel message to the hearts of the people. And beat the forces of darkness back. And bring people to righteousness. People to salvation. Bring people to the reality of knowing the Lord. And make people to thirst. After righteousness. After holiness. After sanctification. After purity of heart. When Paul the Apostle could not go, the Lord revealed unto him sustainable strategies. The strategy of writing. The strategy of putting the message on paper. Something that will not be destroyed. Something that will live from generation to generation. Something that will abide and stand the test of time. The reaching word, the reaching epistle, printed out and distributed everywhere. Thessalonians read it, Colossians read it, Laodiceans read it, Philippians read it, first century believers read it, and all through the ages, that same epistle that had been written had been read and has brought people to salvation and to hope and to patience, and to obedience, and to righteousness, and to holiness, to sanctification, to power, to strength, to stability. And we in this generation, we're reading it too. And it's bringing us to salvation, bringing us to sanctification, holiness, bringing us to steadfastness, and stability, solidity in our Christian faith. Let's pray that God will help the church, that you're not abandoned, these sustainable strategies, the use of the printed page, the use of the recorded message, 
the use of the radio, the use of the television, the use of the internet, use of the CDs, the use of the DVDs, the use of all these electronic materials, the use of the radio, the use of telephone, the use of everything, that all these strategies will make use of them to the maximum level so that the watch of God that Satan tries to hinder in one direction that word, of the Lord, that word of the Lord will go on in every direction. And if one avenue misses them, the other avenue, the other approach will catch them. Pray that the Lord will make the church alert, alive, active, to make use all the, of all the strategies available so that the gospel will reach out and go out and be preached without any hindrance. The Lord made Paul the apostle wiser than Satan, wiser than all the hindrances of the enemy. Pray that the Lord will make the church, the leadership of the church, the members of the church, wiser than all the strategies of the enemy. That this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all our cities, in all our villages, in all our nations, in the whole continent, in all the world, before the Lord will come. Pray that we will not be tired. I will not say, Satan has seen that door, has closed one door, therefore we fold our hands, nothing else to be done. Let's pray that the hindrance of the enemy will not stop the expansion of the church, the establishment of the church, the preaching of the gospel, the salvation of souls, the steadfastness of the believers, the revival, the strengthening of the church of the living God. When we pray, God works. When we pray, Satan is restrained. When we pray, stumbling blocks are removed. When we pray, God's servants are released. When we pray, strategies are revealed. When we pray, the work of God will continue to prosper in our hands.